Hey everybody, welcome back to the podcast. It's episode 100, the the magic number. And because it's 100, I wanted to bring a special guest on the show today. Uh, My guest today is David DHH. You all know who he is, but I'll give you a a brief introduction anyway. Uh, He's a legendary creator of Ruby on Rails, the co-founder of Basecamp, co-founder of Hey!, best-selling author of a ton of books. I've got one of them rework here, which I've given out to my staff like a hundred times. I've um, probably account for 50% of your sales at this point, David. Um, And uh, what else? You've got the best office um, in the world. That setup is unreal. Um, I'll I'll show a picture of that on the screen at the moment. But um, thanks for coming on the podcast, uh, David, and, and thanks for your time. My pleasure. Thanks for having me on. The Alfie Wattam Podcast. Hey, this podcast is brought to you by WeLoveAlpha.com. If you're looking to grow and hire and scale your software engineering team in the UK, then go to WeLoveAlpha.com to hire the best software developers on the market. Everything across Java to C Sharp to PHP to Python to React and Angular and mobile and more. Go to WeLoveAlpha.com to hire the best software engineers in the UK now. So, um, quite topical, but you're you're leaving the cloud. What's what, what's the story there, mate? What's happening? Yes. So we have run both in the cloud and on our own hardware for a really long time. I think we adopted S3 all the way back in 2010 or 12 or 10 plus years ago. So okay. that was the first uh, foot into the cloud. And then about five years ago, we went in deeper. And then when Hey, we went all in. Hey launched as an entirely cloud only operation when we went live in 2020. Mm-hmm. And then things started to go a little sour. Okay. And the reason they went a little sour was because I started seeing the damn bills. Yeah, yeah. And they were expensive. outrageous. Um, and they kept getting more and more outrageous. And I kept having this thought in my head that, you know what? This is just a temporary transition. There's all this cool stuff happening in hardware right now. We are going to be beneficiaries of Moore's law and cloud pricing is going to come down. What happened? Price uh, cloud, uh, cloud pricing did not come down, yeah. right? They've stayed high. And all the ones who are getting whatever the sweet deals on clouds are the Netflixes of the world and wherever are using these clouds in in, in a way with mega usage. This just was nuts, right? Mm. We're a mid-sized SaaS company. Um, and the bills did just didn't make sense. So that was the one part of it. And then the other part of it was, that didn't make any sense was it was no easier. I bought into the narrative that the cloud was going to make it easier to run your applications. Mm. You were going to need fewer operations staff. The configuration was going to be easier. The monitoring was going to be easier. And now we've tried hard with very good people for five plus years to realize some savings in terms of productivity. And we've seen just about bupkis squat, nothing diddly do. Those two things together, you just go like, this doesn't make sense anymore. Mm. All the while we've been all in with Hey on the cloud, we kept running Basecamp on our own hardware. So we kept having one foot in the camp of, do you know what? What does it cost to run your own stuff? What complications are there in running your own stuff? And and I just, I was sold the cloud dream. I bought the cloud dream. I bought the idea. Um, I bought the metaphor that like, oh, we shouldn't all be making our own power. Why are you running your own power plant? Are you in the power plant business? <laughs> no, just buy your electricity from the plant, right? And I went like, yeah, yeah, we're not in the infrastructure business. Why are we running our own hardware? That was a very, very clever sales tactic. I really got to just clap, clap, clap. Whoever came up with that metaphor, um, that's a billion dollar campaign or maybe even a trillion dollar campaign. But it just wasn't true. It was not true at our scale. Um, We tried very hard for many years with great people. We could not make it add up. So... We finally sort of opened our eyes, saw that the emperor had no clothes in our situation and went, you know what? Let's get out. No mm. more. No mas. Time to leave. And, um, and of course, once we made that sort of decision, which was multiple factors, right? Like it was cost. It was the lack of productivity gains. It was this unnerving sense that when 
U.S. East 1, which is the most popular AWS region, goes down. Seemingly yep. like a third of the internet is offline. And you just go like, wait a minute. Wasn't the internet designed to be this decentralized wonder where everyone have their own computers and we're not interconnected in a way where if one provider goes down, then everyone goes with them. And it's just like, I don't want that future for the internet. I do not want the internet to be owned by five hyperscalers. Mm. And I'm not going to contribute to that. Uh, I owe my entire career, my fortune, my everything in terms of work to the internet. I need to do to the internet as, as I wish it do unto me. Yeah. And for us, that meant getting out, working with smaller providers, owning our own stuff. And, um, and, and here we are. We have now on a hyper accelerated path to get out because this is kind of like this thing. We have this switch, right? Like when the switch turns on and the number that is sitting in my head right now is we are spending $38,000 per week Whoa. on the cloud on stuff we don't need to. Yeah, We just placed a mammoth order with Dell to mm -hmm. replace a bunch of stuff. That's going to come home. That's already paid for. We swiped the card mm -hmm. yeah. um, a couple of days ago. Like all sunk costs. Right now, what I'm just looking at, like that clock is ticking. $38,000 a week. The faster we get out of the cloud, the faster that $38,000 a week goes to zero. Yeah. I'm it'll in be, a hurry. It'll be interesting to see if other companies follow suit. Um, because when when it only takes one or two dominoes to fall for these kind of trends to... to oh, they already have. Thing. So this Absolutely. is the beauty of it. Yeah. Tons of people are doing this already, but they're doing it very quietly. Yes. Because part of the problem here is you have to first accept in part that you made a mistake we made a mistake or yeah. mistake is even the wrong word we bet on trends that we thought were going to go in a certain direction and they didn't mm. now it's not that different from all these tech companies that perhaps overhired during the pandemic because they saw demand all of a sudden sure. spiking and then things return to trend line and they go like oh oops we thought this was a a decade worth leap in mm. terms of uh, demand and so forth and it just wasn't I thought that the cloud was going to keep getting cheaper and it wasn't going to add up to uh, have your own hardware. Oh, okay. That trend line did not materialize. We're, 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 we're a public about it. Like, I don't mind admitting to a bad bet. Mm. Um, I don't think that makes me less of a person. Lots of other people perhaps see things a little differently, specifically if they have a boss and sure. whatever. There's some things there, right? But the stories I've heard, there's so many companies doing this. There's so many companies doing this and they're just not talking about it. Um, and I think this is actually why the post that I made went so bananas viral. Yeah, like literally yeah. millions of people have read the post that I've written on this topic is because there were a ton of people who already knew what was in those posts. Mm -hmm. They had already done the math. They had already reached exactly the same conclusions, but no one wanted to stand up and say, look, the emperor has no clothes. You say the emperor has no clothes. I can't help but imagine a Dali generated image of Andy Jassy uh, walking around naked. But um, um, yeah, yeah, I mean, I, mean I, I should nuance that just a slight bit, right? Sure. I don't think that the cloud is is terrible for all businesses of all kind. I think the cloud is actually wonderful yeah. for a whole host of things. Um, I think you have to be very careful about how you use the cloud, especially as a startup. Now, mm. as a startup, should you be buying mammoth orders of Dell equipment off the gate? No, you should not. Just like you shouldn't sign a 10-year lease. Sure. Your whole operation might be out of business in 18 months. You should absolutely take advantage of this is a speculative venture. How can I minimize my capital expenditures and so on and so forth, right? Cloud, wonderful for that. Now, the danger is that you jump on cloud on that premise, which is a good premise, and then you start using all the proprietary shit. Mm -hmm. And by the time you validated your idea and you're like, oh, this is an ongoing concern. I might actually be able to plan for a five-year amortization scheme. You go like, shit, I cannot get out. This is Hotel California. There's <laughs> only an entrance. There's no exit. That's uh, unfortunate. And there are quite a few startups who are in that predicament right now. And where that really gets my goat going is when that group cohort of startups go like, shit, our costs are out of control. We're not going to be able to raise money at the valuations we were, whatever, six months ago. What do we do? Oh, we got to fire a bunch of people. And I go like, no, no, you don't. Cut your cloud costs first. Do not fire a bunch of people who now go into a terrible job market because you're sending all your money to AWS.
Mm. That is just not a fair or nice or a good or prudent way of running a business, in my opinion. Yeah. So anyway, the cloud has its purpose. If you are a spiky business like Amazon, does the cloud make sense for Amazon? It makes huge sense for Amazon. They have these enormous spikes around Black Friday and Christmas shopping. And then like nothing, comparably speaking, happens in like March. You should absolutely set up in such a way that you can use your side price. You can use all this unused capacity the rest of the year, rent it out to someone who will buy it. Wonderful uh, setup. It's a wonderful setup for anyone who needs like huge spikes. Mm. SaaS companies, mm, not so much. The vast majority of SaaS companies are boring as hell, which is why they're good investments sure. because subscription businesses are incredibly predictable. Our business is so incredibly predictable that at one point we predicted like how much storage did we need like 18 months into the future. <laughs> and we hit the mark with like an error of margin of a half percent or something bananas. Um, when that's your situation, when you have a, a scalable, predictable business, uh, it's a complete, why are you paying to rent? Now, mm. this is really also what gets me, right? Is that in every other way of business and life, people intuitively understand it is more expensive to rent than it is to own. Of there course. are advantages to renting, like there's more flexibility to renting, but it's more expensive. Mm. But it seems like we have to have that like first principles argument when it comes to the cloud. The cloud is renting other people's computers. That's yeah. what it is. Yeah, it's all you're doing at the end of the day. There, there seems to be a trend here, David, with you wanting to take on big tech because the, this battle with AWS is not the first time you've, you've gone after the, the, the Goliaths. I mean, um, obvious Apple situation with, with what happened. Just for the people that aren't aware of, of that backstory, can you just tell us a little bit about kind of the the um, antitrust, you know, your background in that area, the times you've taken on Apple and, and, and Tim and, and that sort of you know situation? Yes. Um, so I've been working on the internet since 94, something like that. And the internet to me was a revelation. It was almost like an anomaly, this marketplace of truly no permissions. I can start a business, put it online. Do I have to ask anyone to do that? No. Does anyone get to tell me whether I can sell my software or not? No. I mean, within the legal limits, I can't sell, I don't know, handguns in Copenhagen online. Sure, that sure. That's not there. But for what we wanted to do, I just am in love with the independence of what I'd like to call the true web. Yeah, yeah. What's been happening since um, especially the iPhone came out is that the internet has been shrinking. It's been consolidated into the hands of a few number of very large now conglomerates. That means they are in all these different businesses at once. I saw Amazon just got into like healthcare and Apple is hawking credit cards. And yeah, like yeah. Yeah. they got their fingers in every single pie and, and the few pies left, they don't have their fingers in. They have designs and plans on getting their fingers in it. So there's this consolidation happening. And I go like, do you know what? Uh, this is going to take the internet in a bad direction. I don't want that. Again, as I said, I owe my career, my business, my fortune to the free internet, not just the internet, yes, not just uh, HTTP mediated, the freedom and independence that comes with that. So I need to stand up and fight for it. And how that really um, radicalized me further still, I mean, I've held these ideal sort of fuzzily for many years was when we launched Hey in 2020. So Hey.com is a new email service and we are taking on Gmail. We're taking on Outlook. And I thought like, all right, stouch competition right there, right? Like you think like, all right, we're going to, we're going to battle with Gmail. Um, okay. Good luck with that. And I'm like, all right, I like the odds anyway. I think we have a far superior product. I think we can convince customers to be consumers rather than the thing being sold. And I think um, innovation in email has basically been at a standstill for 14 years since the introduction of Gmail back in 2004, when we started thinking about, hey, we can do better. Let's take it on. What I did not anticipate was that to go against the boss, fight mm. Gmail, um, we first also had to get through the gatekeeper, Apple. Mm. And this is what happened. So we spent two years developing Hey!, millions of dollars plowed into a totally speculative bet, right? Like if, if you were to pitch this to a VC, they'd go like, what, are you fucking crazy? You want to take on Gmail? They have the most popular product in tech that's free. How can you compete with that? Anyway, we decided to do it. We show up, we build all the stuff. We get our apps, right? This is an email client. You need native apps. Otherwise you're just not yeah, in yeah. the competition. 
we build our native apps, we get them approved on, on Google. Yay! We get them approved on Apple. Yay! Well, yay for about a weekend. We get them, we get the Hey app approved on Friday. Then on Monday is our big launch. And literally like two hours, I think it was after our launch, we push another update to the app because bug fixes early on, blah, blah. <laughs> Apple comes back with like, yeah, we're not approving that. Uh, business model violations. Like, what? What are you talking about? You approved the other app. We're in the app store. What business model violation? Oh, um, you're selling a service and you're not allowing us to get 30% of your revenue. I'm like, what? What are you talking about? We've been doing this for years. We've been, Basecamp has been in the app store since like also 2010 or something like that. Mm -hmm. It's run the same way. What's different? Um, we don't discuss other other cases. This is just what it is. I'm like, are, are you serious? And I'm like, this must just be some underling. There's a misunderstanding. We just need to escalate this to the right people. It'll all get straightened out. Uh, no, we keep escalating, escalating. Again, this is us. Literally uh, four months before the launch of that, Jason and I had done a pro bono seminar for Apple employees <laughs> at no the way. invitation of an Apple product manager who's like, hey, you guys know a lot about remote work. This is the pandemic. We have to do a lot of remote work. Can you come help us? And we thought like, hey, we're golden. We did an ad, a literal ad for Apple back in the 2000s where we're like, oh, Macs are really cool. They're great and, and whatever. We're like, we should be in golden standing with sure, this company. Sure, sure. And they show up and they want to destroy our business unless we give them 30%. And I just go like, no, we're not doing it. I will burn down this goddamn business myself before I let these bandits do it. So we took on this epic battle. It took two weeks. And I think Apple was taken so aback, the fact that anyone would dare say no to them, that they just didn't even really know what to do. And you can, on hey.com slash Apple, I think it is, there's the whole history of it. And it's yes, just yes. fascinating to yeah. read back through it because you can see Apple just go like, wait, this doesn't compute. What do you mean someone is telling us no? We are Apple. You must do as we say. Well, we didn't. And um, and we fought them, and that turned into this whole antitrust battle. I testified in front of Congress. I testified in front of several state houses. This is a really long, drawn-out battle that I was super gung-ho for like two years, and then I got a little discouraged that nothing fucking changed. Um, but then what, what's happening now is that change is finally coming. The thing about the Leviathan of, of state power is that it may come slowly, but when it comes, it comes hard. The EU passed this new uh, Digital Markets Act uh, yes. last yeah. year that's going to come into real effect next year in 2024 that's going to give us everything we want. Yeah. It's basically going to give us the freedom on the phones that we've had on every other computing platform since the beginning of computing. That is, if you make a piece of software and you find a buyer who's willing to pay for it, you can transact. Mm -hmm. This is the logic that Apple has upended together with Google. It's a duopoly. Um, or I actually like to say it's two monopolies conspiring. It's actually not a duopoly because the markets are separated. Sure. Uh, the vast majority of iPhone users are never, ever looking at an Android phone. Um, and uh, and many Android users are not looking at iPhone phones. So these are segregated markets. These are monopolies we're going up against. Um, and for us, when it came to Hey, the most important monopoly was Apple. Mm -hmm. Because for our kind of product, Hey is a subscription service. You have to pay $99 a year to use it. Um, that just... There are more users on the Apple platform who are willing to pay for stuff like that. So that was the most important thing, and which was why it was pretty risky. But it turned out um, phenomenally. I mean, phenomenally, I should say, with some caveat, but great in the sense that we had these expectations. Oh, how many people can we get to use or pay for the service? And we think, like, yeah, maybe a few thousand. Um, we got like tens of thousands of paying customers in the first three weeks because Apple basically gave us a $10 million launch campaign in terms of publicity. Now, it was funny when it was going on, people were accusing, you designed this. Like this was just a ploy. You're like, how did we design the scheme where first Apple approves us and then they don't and then we almost get our business destroyed? Uh, yeah, no, I'm not that type of gambler. I do not risk two years of my labor millions of dollars of development on like a marketing campaign. But if I get one handed to me, uh, I will take advantage of it. And we did. And and Hey has been thriving off that. But holy shit, it was a, um, a wild two weeks. I mean, yeah. of the history of this company, I've been working with 37 Signals now for 21 and a half years. There are like three episodes I can remember that kind of just 
I could watch on my aura ring, like my stress levels being through the roof. And that Apple event was, uh, was right up there. Hey, really quick video just to give you a free subscription to Coda Magazine. Coda is the number one publication for all the latest tech news, expert insights, and exclusive industry interviews. With Coda, you get the inside scoop on what's happening with Elon Musk, with Bill Gates, with Jeff Bezos, with Mark Zuckerberg, and so much more. So if you work in the technology industry, then I'd highly recommend that you give Coda a read today. Just scan the QR code on the screen for free access now, or go to welovealpha.com forward slash magazine to get your free subscription today. Um, it's interesting to see the after effects, going back to what I mentioned earlier with, with the dominoes, how this is um, yes. led on to Epic Games and um, even Elon with, with Twitter and how he's encouraging people to, to purchase not through the App Store. But it'll be interesting to see what happens when you have um, an alternative platform to purchase um, the products through and, and, and what the effect that has on the rest of the developer community um, going into 2024 and, and beyond. Um, you and, um, and Jason, when you started 37 Signals, you've gone on, on an amazing journey from building you know multiple successful um tech startups a lot of people that watch this show are starting out on their entrepreneurial journeys building companies you've been there you've you've literally got the t-shirt as, as we're, we're having this conversation mate um what tips what advice would what insights would you give to people that are where you are 20 years ago in 2023 if, if that makes sense Yes. So this is a topic I've written several books on, but I'll try to distill it um, to the things that are top of mind for me is um, independence is priceless. Mm -hmm. And it is so easy to sell that independence very early on in your quote unquote journey. I fucking hate that word, <laughs> but let's use it anyway. Um, to m people who give you a bunch of money and sell you a dream on getting to the moon in record time. Don't get to the moon in record time. Earth is a nice place to be. Build a nice place on Earth first. Then decide whether you want to build your own moon rockets. I think that's great. Some people should be shooting for the moon. But selling your independence to get there very early on can be a um, bad trade, to put it mildly. And part of this comes because I think a lot of entrepreneurs, they're in too much of a goddamn hurry. Mm. When we started uh, Basecamp or when we launched Basecamp back in 2004, we were four people. One programmer, me, who did everything technical, two designers, Jason and Ryan, and a, and a writer, sweeper, someone who could do everything in, in math. That was it. We launched Basecamp. Um, we had an audience already at that point. It wasn't a large audience, but it was an audience. Basecamp launches, it, it goes really well. We do nothing for a year. Basecamp runs as a side project for four people. While we continue with our direct clients, we build it as a side project. It takes over a year before we decide, oh, you know what? There's enough margin here. We can switch over to do Basecamp full time. We do that. And Basecamp continues to grow and, and, and everything. Like two, three years into it, we're like seven people. Don't be in such a damn hurry to grow. Yeah. Find ways to embrace the fact that you are small. Small is not a stepping stone. Small is amazing. I mean, I wake up quite a lot of days wishing we were smaller and we're just 80 people. We're not large by any sense of imagination. But those early days, I find a lot of entrepreneurs, they're in such a hurry to get through that phase. Oh, this is just like, uh, I got to get on to the next thing and I got to raise a big round. I got to, no, 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 dude, calm down, chill. Uh, most good things take a long time to build. Yeah, so Steve Jobs said that a great team of A players, a small team of A players can run circles around a, a large team of B players and, and C players. And we're seeing the effects of this with, with Twitter and and then the subsequent layoffs all across big tech. And whilst those layoffs are small compared to the mass hiring that happened during the pandemic, um, it's still interesting to see that the 2023 and 2024 will be the year of doing more with less, if that makes sense. So, you know, going back to, to, to your point there, um, quality over, over quantity often is a way to build a startup to build a company as opposed to just trying to focus on on headcount and, and, and bums on seats um before we finish um wanted to ask around ruby on rails obviously when you built this 
in uh, 2003, um, just an idea, just a concept at the time, but but now it's being used by, by Twitch, by Airbnb, by you know Shopify and, and so many others around the world. Um, I actually run a, um, a technology recruitment agency and I've um, made hundreds of thousands over the past couple of years on hiring Ruby on Rail developers. So so thank you for, for, for that as well. I probably should, should uh, send you a check or, or buy you a beer next time you're in London. But um, did you think it would have the impact that it's had on, on, on the world and, and the businesses it's powered and, and created and and the legacy that, that that's led to did did you imagine that would be the case absolutely not i mean sometimes i, I wake up and wish i wish i had that sort of self-delusional <laughs> grandeur built in that i could see the future like that i think uh, it's good for the world to have some of those people i feel like i have a healthy amount of both optimism and believe in myself but obviously no idea and also it wasn't the intent i built ruby and rails for myself I built Ruby on Rails because I fell in love with this beautiful programming language, Ruby, that has not been surpassed since. The, the light of Ruby has not dimmed one iota from when I first discovered it over 20 years ago. Um, and I'm paying tribute to that beautiful programming language, Ruby Rails. And I want to use Ruby all day for all the things, right? So I built Rails to do it so that I could build my own applications in it and then release it to the world. And I just felt like there was almost like an evangelical mission here is that like Ruby to me, I credit my entire career as a programmer to that programming language. Like it for me flipped my bit from programming languages or things you use to get the job done, whatever, to programming languages are expressions of human creativity, art, and intellect. Mm. Like the highest ideals possible were awakened in me by discovering Ruby. Do you know what? More people should know about this. More people should have that joy and revelation of finding Ruby if it so fits their brain. There are plenty of people who've tried Ruby and go like, eh, that's not how my brain works. I want to use a functional programming language or I like Java or static typing. Wonderful. May we all find our calling if, um, if that's what it is. But for me, Ruby was it. And I wanted to spread it wide and far. And I wanted as many people as possible to at least get a taste and an opportunity to try Ruby. And if they so find it to their liking, be able to build a business in it, be mm. able to get a job with it. And this is where I marry sort of commerce and, and creativity and art. Like to me, they're all facets of the same thing that if you have something that is beautiful, make it commercially viable so that more people can enjoy it. Awesome. Cool. Well, thank you so much, David, for coming on. It was great to get your insights, your perspective, your point of view. It would be awesome to do another one of these and see how the cloud journey is going, perhaps in, in, in the future and uh, and what other companies can learn from that adventure as well. Um, you've got the racing coming up soon, don't you? I know that you are obviously a polymath and a man of many, many talents. But um, just just quickly tell us about the, the racing. I've seen the car. I'll show a picture of it on the screen with the halo logo on it. Uh, what, what's the uh, the story there? Yes, I am going back to the 24 Hours of Le Mans, the greatest motor race in the world for the 10th time this year. Wow. It is the 100th year anniversary of that race. It started in 1923. It's going to be amazing. I'm racing in car number 28 with the Jota team, uh, a British outfit. We're going for the full FIA World Endurance Championship for another, uh, another go. I'm actually just taking off on Sunday for our first testing of the season. Oh, cool. It's going to be a blast. Uh, I mean, I'm not a spring chicken anymore, so who knows how long I can drive a race car really fast. And I'm going to make sure I take the opportunity for as long as it's there. Can't wait to uh, to get started with that. If people are interested in that journey or anything else on dhh.dk there's links to my instagram where i post a bunch of racing stuff and links to all of my writing and the books we've mentioned as well awesome i'll show that on the on the screen as well would highly recommend people check out uh, those as well as rework and, uh, and remote and, and your other adventures they're always a good read well thanks david you're welcome back anytime and uh, thank you everybody for, for watching as well Hey, thanks for watching this podcast make sure that you like subscribe follow comment etc etc and i'll see you in the next episode the alfie watton podcast imagine if you were able to hire the next elon musk or if you got a job at facebook back when it was just a startup well these people and these opportunities, they are still out there, and we have access to them. Access to all of them. At Alpha Technology, we specialize in software development recruitment, 
across London and the UK. From React to Java to C Sharp and more, we represent the best front end, back end, and full stack engineers on the market. This includes top developers from Meta, Amazon, Apple, Netflix, Google, and more. Our clients operate across AI, blockchain, VR, AR, fintech, edtech, health tech, and more. From startups to global enterprises and everything in between. But Alpha isn't just a recruitment agency. We are also a tech community. We host podcasts, run meetup events, and lead EDI initiatives, supporting women in technology, BAME individuals, and the tech for good ecosystem. So, if you're a company looking to hire software engineers, or if you're a developer open to new opportunities yourself, then we are here to help. Alpha Technology. Recruiting for the future.